may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Count the cross. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke, we also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Amen. So that we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Yes, thank you, Lord. What an encouraging text. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Amen. Amen. And because of that, we can sing this song. When peace like a river
around us, with all that we see happening, with all that we hear from this world and from all the people around us, God, we can still say, it is well with my soul because you are a good God. You are a loving God. You are kind and merciful and gracious. You've proven this through our history with the way you've dealt with us. God, you are worthy of us bowing the knee. You are worthy of our love toward you. You are worthy of our lives. So may our lives be yours. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the grace that we need to lay our lives down daily for your sake. For your name's sake, that your name may be made holy. We love you and we thank you. Be with the man of God as he comes forth. Give him the strength he needs, Lord. May all the time that he's put into studying come back to remembrance. All the words, the thoughts, the things that you've given him to deliver today. May it come back sharply and may it be delivered well for your glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Third time's the charm. Good afternoon. <laughs> so today we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. Um, we're going to be focusing on verses 11 through 32. So you can start making your way there. And I'm not sure if you guys know this, but the, the Gospels is full of parables. Um, there's over 50 parables. And I think the one that we're going to be looking at today is probably the most popular parable in all of scripture. Um, the only one that I can think of that might be close is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, maybe you guys would dispute that and have another parable that you think might be the most popular. But I think this parable, the parable of the prodigal son, is not just popular in church, but also in the world. And for good reason, there's so many different themes and there's different uh, Themes and illustrations that come from just this one parable. I'm just going to name a few of those themes. You have rebellion, you have repentance, acceptance, confession, compassion, the love of God, regret, self-indulgence, guilt, deliverance from sin and forgiveness. There's 11. And I'm pretty sure you guys can come up with even more than that. And of course, it goes without saying that we don't have time to explore every one of the possible topics that we can pull from this text or even talk about all the ways we can apply, uh, apply this passage to our lives. So it's good to know that there is context to the passage that we're going to look at today, and it's going to be in the first two verses of Luke chapter 15. But while we consider the reason why Jesus responded the way he did in his time, what I want to do is answer the question also of how is it that the Holy Spirit is molding us into the image of Christ through a story of a father and two lost brothers like how are we being sanctified how are we being molded more into the image of christ as we look at this story between the father and his sons so while scripture is not about you it has been written for you and i say that because there's this common perception within the body of christ and in the world that this passage has little meaning for us who are not lost that this passage has nothing to say to those of us who are more seasoned than the less salty Christians, if you remember the last text that we went over. This passage is supposedly reserved for a season in life in which we find ourselves wandering away from the fold of God. But does this passage have something to say to those of us who maybe haven't strayed physically? Is it possible for us to stray mentally? Well, if this is your mindset, let me both warn and encourage you with the title of today's sermon, which is Don't Be a Pharisee. Rejoice. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for gathering us together to worship you and to proclaim your name. Lord, thank you for pulling us from the outside and bringing us near. And thank you for welcoming us with open arms and showering us with your blessings through your son. Lord, I just pray that your word will be magnified, Lord, and that we will walk away um, encouraged and considering the blessing it is to be called your child. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we jump into it, I want to do a brief recap um, because I think it's vital in order to understand the parable that we're looking at today to consider all of the parables in Luke chapter 15, 
which is really a trilogy of parables, which are all a response to the Pharisees and scribes in verse two. Um, but I do want to go back just a little bit further real briefly in chapter 14. And we're going to go from verse 34 to verse two of chapter 15, just to bring in the setting of what led to the prodigal son parable. So in verse 34, it says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Well, what follows in chapter 15 is actually a series of examples of what it looks like to be a saltless, so-called follower of God. He who has an ear, let him hear. Notice that it was the outcasts. It was the sinners who would actually draw near to listen to the message of Christ. But it was the religious leaders who were always making accusations against the Messiah. Instead of being sought, the Pharisees and the scribes were always bitter. And it wasn't just towards sinners, but it was towards Christ. And the reason was clear. Jesus would minister to the very people that they rejected. The Pharisees and the scribes didn't just look down on sinners, but they would rather them stay down than to see them standing upright. So Jesus proceeds to expose them once again here in chapter 15. And the way he does it reminds me of another sales tactic where you're leading a potential buyer through a series of questions, all questions that they would agree with, with the intentions of asking them to buy. And the purpose is if you agree with all of this, then surely you wouldn't object to buying, right? And you just get your head nodding along with them. So this is what Jesus does with the sequence of parables that we find here in chapter 15. So it's important to know that these are not illustrations that stand alone, but it's one single response to the accusations and the, uh, of, of the Pharisees and the scribes. And I think they increase in intensity for the purpose of exposing the Pharisees hearts. So what am I getting at? Well, let's consider what led to our parable today. In the first parable, it's a no brainer that the shep the shepherd would go after the one sheep that strayed. Right. It's a no brainer that he would go after him. Verse four says, what man among you wouldn't go after the sheep that has been lost? The point being, it would be foolish not to. Right. Likewise, we see in verse eight, what woman would not search for a lost coin? Again, the point being, of course, she would search for it and celebrate finding it. Right. Especially if this woman was single, if she was a widow, searching for that lost coin would have literally been a matter of life and death. If these reactions are a no brainer, how much more a lost son being found? Right. So you would think. So for those taking notes, I just want to make five observations about this parable. First is going to be the rebellion of the son in verses 11 through 16. The repentance of the son in verses 17 through 21. The rejoicing of the father in verses 22 through 24, the resentment of the older brother in verses 25 through 30, and the reminder of the father in the final two verses, 31 and 32. Now, of course, this is a longer passage um, than we usually go through. So instead of doing it the way I normally do it, where I would read through the entire passage and then read it again as I make it through each point, what I'm just going to do now is I'm going to read each section that has to do with the heading that we're reading at the time. All right, so we're going to begin with the rebellion of the son in verses 11 through 16. And he said there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. So right away here in this parable, we notice a difference between the first two that came before it. There is a greater significance. And it's not just because this is the final point that Jesus is making to the Pharisees accusations. But notice we're not just dealing with the loss of possessions like sheep and finances, things that can easily be replaced. Here, what we're actually dealing with is a human, someone created in God's image. We're, we're dealing with the loss of a son or a brother. Also notice the other parables 
don't have three main characters involved. So you have a father and two brothers. And the younger of the two, he actually commits this ultimate level of disrespect against his father. And so you can already imagine the faces of the Pharisees and scribes who are experts in the law, waiting to be judgmental. You're supposed to honor your mother and father. So you can already see Jesus setting the table. The younger son approaches his father and he demands for him to give him his inheritance. So forget the faces of the Pharisees and scribes. Imagine the face of your parents if this was you. Or imagine how you would respond if this was your child. Your child having nothing completely dependent on you. Totally indebted to you, raised by you, taught by you, fed by you, clothed by you. And here they are demanding for you to give up everything that you toiled your entire life to build up, to then transfer to them when it was time. Sure, it was his, but not until the transfer was made. But what makes this so disrespectful is that the father would not give this or it would not be given to the son until the father died. And so how would the father of this so-called son have received this. It would have been equivalent to wishing that he was dead. His father was actually the only thing standing between him and his carnal desires. So as far as he was concerned, his father was dead to him. In the story, the father actually obliges. He gives his son his inheritance. In fact, in fact, he gives both sons their inheritance at the same time. We see that in verse 12. He divided his property between them. And so according to tradition, we see this in Deuteronomy 21, the older of the brothers would have gotten a double portion. So he would have gotten two thirds. The younger brother would have gotten one third. And I'm only pointing this out because we're going to see something a little bit later that I think really highlights the heart of the Pharisees, because the older brother also received his inheritance. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind for now. So what's described next is this actually this chain of events that gives rise to the popular topic or title of our parable. The younger son picks up his things and he journeys into a far country. In other words, he goes as far away from his family as possible so he can live life according to his own terms. Others have said the far country is not necessarily this distant place that we must travel. But first of all, this far country actually exists within our own hearts. The younger son dreamed of enjoying his freedom far away from home, far from his father and his brothers. Quote, if the lost sheep was lost through foolishness and the coin through carelessness, then the son was lost out of willfulness. And so I have to say we have to guard our hearts because actually the manifestation of sin is merely a tip of the iceberg. You would never see it if it wasn't for that enormous chunk that's hidden beneath the waters. Brothers and sisters, we must guard our hearts from the drift, as the ambassador would say, drifting away from the protection of the love of our father in order to chase after everything his son died for. Guard yourself from that far country in your heart. Make war against it. Destroy it. At least you become a citizen, a ruler or a captive there. There where he squandered his property in reckless living. Hence the term prodigal, which is a 15th century term. And it can be used both as an adjective to drive away, squander, waste, or to be reckless, or it can be used as a noun, one who spends or lives lavishly and foolishly. I was just made aware that Tim Keller has a book out and it's titled The Prodigal God. Um, from a friend of mine was telling me from the conclusions of the book, it really honed in on the fact that although the son did all of this, right, just like us, the father still goes after us, right? But if we just look at the definition of prodigal, I don't see how we can even add that. It's kind of like the song Reckless Love, right? To squander, to live lavishly and foolishly. God is not foolish, but we are at times, right? And you might say, I've never taken anything for granted from my parents. But many times we do that to the grace and the mercy of God, right? At times we find ourselves coming so close to just disregarding all that Jesus has done for us even his work on the cross. We find ourselves in the sandals of Peter who denied Christ. Maybe we don't do it in word, but at times we do it in deed, right? Every time we sin, it's like we're living as atheists. We're living as if God doesn't exist. We're living as if God is dead to us. And so I had to ask myself just as I was preparing this sermon, what makes me different than this prodigal son if I was to examine my own heart? If this distant place isn't just actually a physical location, are there different parts in the recesses of my heart where I'm actually far away from God when I should be close? 
What makes me different even than the older brother? We'll see something about that a little bit later. But not only did he spend everything, verses 14 through 16 says he found himself in a severe famine, not just being without all that his heart desires, but he was actually without things that he needed for survival, such as food and shelter. So notice how Jesus paints the picture. This is what rebellion led him to. He wasted away all that he had and he was able to keep up with the lifestyle that he was enjoying. And probably to save himself the embarrassment, he takes a job with a citizen of a foreign country. Right. He went from being with his father, who had so many resources, where he probably would have been in the position of a supervisor. And instead, he finds himself in a field feeding pigs. Let's not forget, this is all a response to the Pharisees that Jesus is making. And here, Jesus is feeding their desire to be judgmental. Jesus is feeding their desire to be hypocritical, all in order to prove a point. So I don't believe there's a hidden message or some kind of allegory in every point of this story. Jesus is simply painting a picture that would expose the hearts of the Pharisees and probably expose the hearts of some of us. Here's a prime example. Not only did the young man wish that his father was dead, not only did he live recklessly, not only did he basically sell himself to a foreigner, he was working with an unclean animal. As the story goes on, Jesus is compounding the event, the offense of the prodigal by casting him as someone who disregarded every Jewish tradition. Not only did he work with the unclean animal, but he became unclean and even ate what the pigs ate because he had no one who would give him anything. At this point, I just need to stop and just warn all of us here who are here today who might be in this position, who might be a prodigal. This is rock bottom. This is what's ahead. This is what you'll, where you'll find yourself if you're wandering from the flock of God, because outside of a covenant relationship with Christ, there is nothing out there for you. Although the grass may look greener, I can promise you underneath that grass is the dead bones, the spiritually dead bones of men and women who thought the same thing. If this is where you are here today, stick around because there is hope for you. Even if you have gone as far as the grave itself, right? We serve a God who has defeated sin, death, and the grave. We serve a God who is determined to seek and to save the law. So you don't have to continue living in this foreign land. You don't have to continue living in famine. You don't have to continue living as the very thing that God hates. And the son finally recognizes this. So let's move on to the second observation, the repentance of the son in verses 17 through 21. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while, his, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Many of you guys know this. There's nothing that helps us come to our senses like experience, right? But this is what sin does. Sin blinds us. Sin keeps us from seeing the things that God is setting before us. It makes us deaf. It keeps us from hearing his voice. It mars. Sin wounds us. It keeps us from reaching out to God and even fleeing away from destruction. Even though the world will have you think you're doing just fine. You're free from the restraints of his holiness and the glory of God. So you can kind of live life according to your own terms. It will have you believe that you're complete because of that, even though the reality is you're broken. However, when God is working in us, our sin reveals to us and reminds us of our need for a savior and our need for repentance. The text says he came to himself after losing it all. After finding himself in a feeding trough, starving, he thought about his father. He thought about the goodness of his father. He thought about the love his father had even for his servants. He thought about these things. So I have to say this to the parents, right? We have children. Our children are going to grow up if they're not grown already. So what have you done or what are you doing that will cause your children to remember you in the moments when they're destroying their life? Or better yet, what have they seen in you that will keep them from just destroying their life to begin with? Are we setting before them memories that will cause them to think about the love and the kindness of God? Or are we creating an environment that would discourage repentance? 
When they remember you, will it draw them near or cause them to digress even further? Considering in the other two parables, the main character went after what was lost. You would think the father did also. But in this parable, there's actually a reversal. The father didn't go after the son who demanded and wasted away his inheritance. But the son actually returns to his father. At this point, I jotted down Romans 2, 4 says this. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. While quoting from this passage as it relates to Luke 15, 17, it's good, it's true, it's encouraging, but in and of itself, it actually misses the overall point of this parable, at least in the immediate context. Again, we have to remember that Jesus is responding to the Pharisees. So let's look again. This time we're going to start in verse one of Romans chapter two. After writing about the wrath of God towards those who practice unrighteousness, this is what Paul says. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It was the kindness of the father that led the prodigal son to return, to turn from his ways. Yet, as the Pharisees would have it, the Pharisees and the scribes, when they witnessed the love and the kindness of God, they would take it for granted and it would actually lead them to self-righteousness and condemnation. They would judge with unjust scales and standards. The so-called leaders were prideful and arrogant. That's why Jesus would call them whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they look good, but on the inside, they were full of dead bones. So the son comes to his senses, and as he does, he makes three statements as he plans his return home. And what he confesses in his actions that follow really give us a template of what it looks like to repent. One, he acknowledges his sin before heaven. He acknowledges his sin before his father. And because of it, he realized that he was unworthy to even be called his son. So when you sin, do you first acknowledge your sin against God? Many times I don't. When I sin against someone or, you know, I don't first think that this was a sin that was committed against God. Even though all sin is ultimately committed against God because we went against his law. It was his law that we broke. It's God that we misrepresented. We're his image bearers. We are to image God. And so actually what it looks like when we sin, what we're doing is we're painting a false portrait a blasphemous portrait of God, and we're putting it on display. We put it on display for the whole world to see. Is God a liar? Is God a thief? You can answer. Is God a murderer? Is God unfaithful? Is God greedy, wasteful, or reckless? Is God a prodigal? (laughs) Every time we sin, we're actually saying yes to all of those questions. In addition to this, we see the absolute necessity of seeking forgiveness from the people that we sinned against. Just because we ultimately sinned against God doesn't keep us from reconciling relationships that we damaged because we sinned against our brothers and sisters. We're not exempt. If we're to forgive our brother 70 times seven, then we should seek forgiveness 70 times seven times. Therefore, it's important for us to love our neighbors and to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Because the way we interact with others is a picture of our interaction or our love for God. And so we cannot say we love God and at the same time hate our brothers. So how important is this? Matthew 5, 21 through 24. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before you go to the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. We have no business coming before the throne of God when we have things that are pent up. Things, anger and things that we have in our minds, things that we're thinking negatively towards our brother because they offended us. Or we're not big enough to go and ask for forgiveness when we committed a fault. How about for husbands? 
Is it important for God to hear your prayers? It is important for God to respond when we have a need. First Peter 3, 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in understanding in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you to the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. We ought to be reminded of the goodness of our father and come to our senses in our dealings with one another, because apart from Christ, we, too, are unworthy to be called his son. And so we have the dilemma. A father loses his son. The son comes to his senses and he seeks forgiveness, the forgiveness of his father. And here we get to my favorite part of the entire parable, because we see something that you don't see nowadays. We see this in verse 20. The father does something very rare. It says, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. <laughs> Even though he was a long way off, his father saw him. Imagine if your child ran off, right? With this inheritance that they demanded from you, right? Maybe something that maybe on a scale that we can actually do. Say your son leaves home and he takes the car and he loses the car because he couldn't pay off gambling debts. Or say your child took possession of the family property and lost it to the bank, right? When they return home, I, I think you might have some choice words for them, right? Like, how would you respond the moment that you saw them? I can't tell you how many times selling life insurance that a mother or a father wouldn't name their child as beneficiary because they were holding the grudge against them. A brother or a sister, they wouldn't trust their family with their final expenses because they were still holding a grudge. Even in this illustration Jesus gave, if the father met his son with rejection or discipline, would he be wrong? The father doesn't owe him anything. He already gave him what he didn't even deserve. Anything else would be more than he deserved. But before the son would even verbally repent to his father, his father saw him. Just imagine how unrecognizable this son would have been after losing everything, after losing his mind. Imagine his clothes. Imagine all of the visible differences that come from a lifestyle filled with sin. Yet his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. So he took off running. And once he was close, what did the father do? He touched the unclean thing. He embraced him. Other translations say, say that he threw his arms around him, that he was running to him and he fell on the neck of his son. This filthy, undeserving son is met with this kind of love that you would imagine a father giving a son returning home from war, right? You finally get to see him or your son coming home from a semester at college or he graduated. This is the kind of love that you would expect a father to give that kind of son. And so what kind of love is this that one would run with desperation and embrace the one who committed this ultimate level of offense to them? And sure, this is just one of many stories. This didn't actually happen. This is one of many stories that Jesus gave. But make no mistake, Jesus is revealing the nature of the Father's love towards us, who by God's grace have come to our senses through his spirit, renewing our minds. His love and kindness that leads us to repentance. And even as he calls us to himself, what does he do? He meets us where we are. The God who sees his children with compassion, although his eyes could easily turn us into a pile of dust and rightfully so. At this point, the prodigal son properly repents and he voices his faults to his father in verse 21. He says that he sins against God. He sinned against his father. And because of that, he was unworthy to be called his child. So Jesus continues the theme of the two parables that led to this one. The shepherd who found the one lost sheep in verse five, it says after that, he calls his friends and invited them to rejoice along with him. When the woman found the coin that she lost in verse nine, it says, she called her women friends and her neighbors to rejoice along with her. So now let's consider the rejoicing of the father in verse 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Others have pointed out this threefold symbol of freedom and honor restored as the fruit of perfect reconciliation. As the father cleans him up so he can show him off, he covers his nakedness, right? In other words, he covers his guilt 
and his shame. Isn't this what the father does? Isn't this what God has done for us? Isaiah 61 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Amen. Although his son rightly recognized he was unworthy, the father reassured his sonship as he showers him with gifts and a celebration. I just do want to read one quote from a commentary. I think it really points out like the significance of this point in the passage. He says the ring was a sign of sonship. In the best robe, no doubt the father's was proof of his acceptance back into the family. Servants did not wear rings, shoes or expensive garments. The feast was the father's way of showing his joy and sharing it with others. Had the boy been dealt with according to the law, there would have been a funeral, not a feast. What a beautiful illustration of Psalm 103, 10 through 14. It says this. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. All of us should say amen right there. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so, show, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. You notice everything he lost, Clothes, food, shelter, love. Not only was it restored, but it was given back to him in abundance out of the love of his father. Not just nice clothes in a ring, but the choices of meals. It was a special occasion, occasion. So the father actually gets the fattened calf and has it prepared for him. He went into this world as if something was being held back for him. But when he got back, his father was waiting to shower him with all the best things showing the abundant nature of the blessings of God. So they celebrate as the father acknowledges his son publicly. He says, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Doesn't this passage just scream the gospel? Doesn't this illustration provide a picture for us of the love of Christ for the lost? However, this is the point. This was the problem. This was the complaint that the Pharisees and the scribes were making, that this man receives sinners and he eats with them. In their eyes, Jesus was guilty by association. In fact, Jesus didn't just hang around sinners, but he was friends of sinners, like real sinners. He went and he ate at the table of a tax collector. He invited the tax collector to his table and became one of the 12. Jesus was constantly surrounded by sinners, and this presented a major problem to the Pharisees. So Jesus had a special character in the parable who would be the very representation of their attitude. And we see this in the resentment of the older son in verse 15 or uh, 25 through 30, which says this. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, um, when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat and calf for him. So during this celebration, his brother becomes aware of what's going on, the music, the dancing, the celebration, the, the fattened calf being killed as a celebratory response to his repentance. This is the part of the story that just makes you scratch your head, because when the, um, the, the, the story of the shepherd and the sheep finding what was lost, they celebrated. And so you would think that the older brother would celebrate the repentance of his younger brother, right? But instead, he refused to go in. Instead of rejoicing, he became angry. Instead of commending his father for his compassion, he resented him. Instead of making a toast to the repentance of his brother, he became self-righteous. He became jealous and even refused to embrace his brother or even, even call him his brother. He says, 
this son of yours. <laughs> and then he goes on to point his finger, just showing how much better of a son he's been the entire time. I served. I never disobeyed. I never left. And you never did any of this for me. Why is it that the Pharisees and the scribes were unable to understand how someone could receive forgiveness after indulging in a life full of sin with prostitutes and pride? The only answer can be because they believe that they receive forgiveness and blessings from God based off of their own righteousness, their own ability to follow the law. And so a good question to consider here would be in the end, which of the two sons was actually lost? Just as a foreign land can be in your heart, you don't have to physically stray to be lost. Just because you're alive physically doesn't mean you aren't dead spiritually. The final observation I would like to make is in verses 31 to 32, the reminder of the father. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Notice the way the father responds to the older son, a.k.a. the Pharisee. He says it was fitting to celebrate and be glad your brother is no longer dead. He is alive. How is it that he would accuse his father of favoritism in this point? How could the older brother even be jealous? Not only did his father view all the possessions that he had as the possessions of the older brother. Remember, the older brother also received his inheritance. He had twice as much as his brother. He had more than twice as much because he also had all the father had. Yet his self-righteousness blinded him from seeing this. If one sheep that was lost was worth searching for or one coin that will be sought after, how much more a wayward son returning home? If you would celebrate finding a lost sheep or a lost coin, then it follows that you should celebrate repentance. Faithful preachers have pointed out the increase in loss across these three parables. Because you go from a 1% loss, 100 sheep, you lose one, you went after the one, and you agree and you celebrate. Then you have the woman who loses one coin out of 10, a 10% loss. You agree that she should go after it and celebrate. Finally, you have a 50% loss, and it's a loss of a son. So there's not only a greater percentage in loss, but there's an even greater recovery as the son comes to himself and seeks restoration as he remembers the love and kindness of his father. Right here within the tension of this dilemma, we find both the reason that Jesus responds the way he does to the Pharisees, as well as the relevance this text has for us, for all believers today. And yes, even those of us who have never strayed away, at least we become prideful because of it. How should the Pharisees have responded to sinners coming to Jesus? Verse seven ended with, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Verse nine ends with this. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And verse 32 says it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. They should have been celebrating the fact that Jesus was there among the sinners because sinners were turning to God because of their, re their interaction with Christ. It was fitting for them to be glad. They should have rejoiced in the Messiah instead of condemning him. And so I have to say, being in this church, I'm encouraged by everyone here. I'm encouraged by this church, by the way we dealt with difficult situations, right? We've created an environment here that actually inspires and embraces repentance and reconciliation. We've walked some tough roads together. We've cried together. We've confronted one another in love. Where is he at? I was going to call out. Zane, he confronted me a few times. And love, right? And we build a stronger bond and unity because of it. And to God be the glory. Having been reconciled to God, may we continue to celebrate the work that he does in the lives of people who are at different points in their journey in life. May we never adopt the attitude of the younger brother who strayed or the arrogance of the Pharisees and the scribes just because they thought they were close. May we never forget the love and kindness of the father towards us. We, too, were lost at one point. May we never forget the father in the moments that our mind does wonder. And may we always rejoice in the salvation of God. So to the prodigal, I say, come back. Come back to the waiting arms of the father. Yes, you deserve his wrath, but he is there waiting to be merciful 
and gracious towards everyone who repents and asks for forgiveness. No matter how far you strayed, no matter how bad what you did was, the Father is there waiting for you to come home. To the Pharisee, the same goes for you. You too deserve the wrath of God. But even self-righteousness can be repented of. And you too can enjoy the benefits of a loving father, a father who showers his children with blessings and he celebrates them. We are only his by grace through faith. So don't be a Pharisee and rejoice in the Lord and with heaven. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for coming after us. Lord, we only turn to you because of your love towards us. Lord, may we always remember your kindness towards us. May we always remember the cross and what it took for us to be yours when we're looking at those who have yet to turn or those who stray away. May we always be humble and may we always rejoice when someone who is lost returns. Lord, I pray that you would apply this text to our heart, to our lives. And I pray that you were glorified in my attempt to preach your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.